Good evening. My name is Pastor Brian Wise, and I want to welcome you to our Savior's Lutheran Church in Naperville to our Good Friday service. This service is typically called a tenebrae service or a service of darkness. This is an opportunity for us as a community to gather around music and the scriptures, which tell us of the passion story where Jesus was crucified. We begin with prayer. Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your whole family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. read from Matthew, the 26th chapter. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. It appears that uh, Jesus knew what was coming. He seemed to know what was going to be happening. And knowing what was going to be happening, that he was going to be going through suffering and then to the cross, what did he want to do? He turned immediately to prayer. It's my hope that in times of need, like we're facing now, like you face in your lives, like I face in mine, that when the difficulties come, that we might immediately turn to our loving Heavenly Father in prayer. And what did he say? He was saying, essentially, isn't there some other way? I'd just as soon not do this. I'd rather have some other way where I can do your will. But then he ends up by saying, but not what I want, instead what you want. And you also notice that he didn't go to pray alone. And just as we are sometimes uh, with just a few people these days, or maybe no one else with us during this time of, of, of separation, he takes just three with him to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's not like they did all that much good. They fell asleep. But still, it was important to him to be surrounded with the people who were close to him. To have the community, in whatever form he could have at that time, with him in prayer. And so as he prayed, let us pray. Gracious God, in the midst of whatever life may bring, pain, heartache, even death, draw us close. Never let us go. Give us hope. Surround us with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. 
Matthew 26, 47 through 56. While Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him. At once he came up to Jesus and said, Greetings, Rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you are here to do. Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly, one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it, and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then? Would the scriptures be fulfilled, which say it must happen in this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But all this has taken place, so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all the disciples deserted him and fled. Usually a kiss conveys love and commitment. A student would often kiss his rabbi on the cheek as a form of greeting and honor. Servants would kiss their master's hands, showing their respect. Judas's kiss, though, was a sign of betrayal. He could have given any sign. He could have simply pointed to Jesus in the garden. Instead, he chose a sign of love and used it as a form of betrayal. Maybe his expectations of what a Messiah should be weren't met in Jesus's words or actions. Perhaps it was his plan all along. Matthew doesn't say why Judas betrayed him. All we hear is how quickly something we hold dear can be radically turned against us. What do we do when our expectations aren't met? When crisis strikes? Do we, like Judas, betray those who hold us dear? Do we, like the one who took his sword, try to rectify the situation on our own terms? Or do we, like Jesus, act out of love, calling out to their friends, silencing violence, and committing to the words of scripture? That is the love of God. When our relationships are broken, when things are turned upside down. What continues always, it's God's promise of love and commitment, no matter the cost. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. A servant girl came and said to him, You were also with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before all of them, saying, I do not know what you are talking about. 
he went out to the porch. Another servant girl saw him and said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, certainly you are also one of them for your accent betrays you. And then he began to curse and swore an oath. I do not know the man. At that moment, the cock crowed. And then Peter remembered what Jesus had said. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. I've always had a soft part in my... I've always had a soft spot in my heart for Peter. Because even though he denies Jesus, he simply is trying to protect himself from having the same thing happen to himself as what he sees happening to Jesus, his friend. I think this is a really powerful scene in the Passion story because we can humanize with Peter's struggle. We have done the same ourselves. The times that I have chosen to allow my cell phone to go to voicemail when I know a friend is calling me who's really in need to help, but I just don't have time to hear it. Or the moments in school where we know that a friend needs help, but we don't offer it because we're just busy with a new group of friends. I think we've all been there. We can all relate. We can all humanize Peter. We might not have been there as a friend was being persecuted for a crime, but we know what it's like to know the truth and deny it. The easier response, it's not me. I don't know him. This is not my problem. You and I, we have all spoken words like this. What I love about this story is that this is not Peter's passion story. And it's not ours. This is the story of about how far God will go for you, for all of us, through the life and love of Jesus. This reading is not about Peter. It's not about us. This is the story of how Jesus remains faithful to us even as we cave under the pressures of society and deny Jesus and our relationship with him. Even as we deny him, Jesus continues on. He knows that this is not the end of the story and that God's love will be the final word. Matthew 27. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you say so. Now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Who do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. 
While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. When I first learned that the name Barabbas means son of the father, all of a sudden this passage came alive for me in a different way. Because what we see is that the one they called Barabbas wasn't really the one who was the son of the father, the only begotten son. That was Jesus. And Jesus was the one who was seeking to speak the truth, who was seeking to bring us life through his love. And I wonder as I read this, am I more like Jesus? Or am I more like Pilate? Jesus, who was willing even to die for what he knew was right. Pilate, who only seemed to be willing to do whatever would save him from the crowds. Do we have the courage in the midst of most difficult times to do what is right, to not be curved in on ourselves, but to reach out in love? Let's pray. Gracious God, give us strength and courage to follow you. In Jesus' name.
Matthew 27, 32 through 44. As they went out, they came upon a man from Cyrene named Simon. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his clothes among themselves by casting lots. Then they sat down there and kept watch over him. Over his head, they had put the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two bandits were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by derided him, shaking their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him, saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross now and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now, if he wants to, for he said, I am God's son. The bandits who were crucified with him also taunted him in the same way. Seemingly, the crowds that just five days ago cried, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, now walked by, taunted, derided, and mocked Jesus, including the bandits on his left and right, who are going through the same humiliation. If he were God's son, he would save himself. If he were the son of David, he'd rescue himself from the grips of the Roman Empire. If he were the son of God, he'd come down from the cross and build a new temple, a new kingdom. Then we would believe. If only. At the end of his earthly life, Jesus faced a nearly unanimous public shaming, a consensus around his guilt, and he was silent. But we find out that in Jesus' silence, he was turning our if-onlys into God's loving purpose for the world. Because he is God's son, he will save. Because he is the son of David, he will rescue us from the grips of empire. Because he is the son of God, he will come down from the cross and build a new kingdom. Just not the way we would like it. But only then can we believe. <laughs>
Let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. Then Jesus cried again with a loud voice and breathed his last. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. After his resurrection, they came out from the tombs and entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over Jesus saw the earthquake and what took place, they were terrified and said, Truly this man was God's son. Many women were also there, looking on from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee and had provided for him. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. Good Friday is for me one of the most powerful worship services that we have in our whole church here. This service feels very different than all other times that we are gathered. This moment that we find ourselves in, this service, is one of the darkest moments for our church. We dim our lights, we keep the music very simple, and we allow the, the scriptures to guide us as we follow Jesus to the cross. The cross today is the only thing being featured. I believe this story is amplified a little bit more this year as we find ourselves in our homes. We are apart from one another. There's no shaking of hands or any kind of warm hospitality. There's no benediction. Today it is just this story of the cross. While we remember the, the death and resurrection of Christ and all of our worship services throughout the year, what makes Good Friday unique is that just like the original followers, we stand at a distance and we watch these things take place. The suffering and the death of Christ is all that we are remembering today. The greatest demonstration of love for all of us is told through Jesus on the cross. He is beaten, mocked, tortured, and crucified. The Son of God reigns triumphantly from his throne on the cross. What looked like the end of a Reformation movement was actually the start of the church. What looked like an instrument of death and torture, God's power prevailed over it. God's love wins in this story. Today, Good Friday, we focus on the cross because the cross is a part of our story of how far God will go to show the world that God loves us. From Matthew 27. When it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. 
So Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn in the rock. He then rolled a great stone to the door of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. This is a time of darkness. It could be that now is a good time in your house to turn the lights down or turn the lights off and spend a moment in the dark as you remember. It's a time of grief. It's a time of loss. It's a time when the light is gone. But we know the end of the story. The darkness is gone for just a little while, and the darkness is never complete. There is grief, but there is also hope. There is loss, but there is also confidence in the one whose love can never leave us, who is always with us. In the darkness, light. In the grief. Let's pray. Gracious God in the darkness, give us your light. Give us hope. In Jesus' name, amen.